Praise God. Well, it's wonderful to be back in the house of the Lord to share the word of the Lord with you. The word of the Lord is so precious. The Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The word of God is so precious. I want to get to the place where I can say like David that his word is more precious than silver or gold. And when we have the word that we will declare, it's like honey, amen, that is sweet to us. Praise God. So it's a great honor to, to continue to share on the power of declaring. And I know that you're going to be blessed today, amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for your precious word. May it be sweeter than honey today. May it be more precious than silver and gold. May you open our eyes to behold the truths of your word today. Give us insight. Give us revelation. A spirit of revelation in the house that we will know you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray with expectancy. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the power of declaring. This is the fourth in the series of the power of declaring. And today, I've entitled it, Open Your Mouth Wide. Open your mouth wide. Can you say that with me? Open your mouth wide. Amen. Now, this is actually a command from the scripture, but we're going to get into it a little bit, and you see why it is important for us to open our mouth wide or to declare things. In the past few weeks, we've been seeing how God has a pattern. He, before he gets ready to do anything, he, he has to speak about it first. He, 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 he declares it. Through his prophets or through his word, one way or the other, he declares that we see that at creation. I'm not going to go through everything, but just to go over really briefly, that God always declares that when Jesus was coming onto the earth to start his ministry, John the Baptist was that voice crying out in the wilderness. And his message was, prepare the way of the Lord. And he was saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. And the reason God did that, because that's his pattern. He usually declares something before he establishes it. Now, we see, we saw, we've seen how declaration is like prayer. It's a form of prayer. It's linked to prayer. So in the book of Job, chapter 22, verse 27 and 28, 28 says, you will declare a thing and it will be established for you. So we, our part is to declare something that we believe, and God's part is to establish it. Amen? So he, we declare, he establishes. God declares something, and he establishes it. Praise God. To declare means to announce, to proclaim. It means to speak emphatically or with confidence, to have strong confidence, and to declare something that you believe or to speak something you believe. To establish is to bring something about or to make something happen. That's basically what it is. So when we speak with conviction, deep conviction, with belief, and, and, and the Bible tells us that God makes it happen. So when we speak God's purposes, he makes it happen. When we believe God's purpose and we speak God's purpose, God makes it happen. When we declare God's purpose or God's will or God's intention or anything in line with God's intention, God makes it happen. Praise God. I'm glad that he doesn't say we have to make it happen. He said, we will speak to the mountain and the mountain will move. He doesn't tell us how the mountain is going to move. He just tells us, you will speak to the mountain, and if you don't doubt in your heart, it will move. Amen. And go into the sea or wherever you tell it to go. Praise God. So making declarations is important. We've seen how making declarations is really tied in with believing. So we see in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, it says that we believe, therefore we speak. We believe, therefore we speak. So when you speak from a place of believing... Believing is when you are persuaded, you are fully persuaded about something to the point where you accept it as true. You are so, it's so real to you that you're confident about it. Amen? That's what believing is. So when you're at a place where you're persuaded in your heart about something and you're so confident about it and you declare it, that is the spirit of faith. Every single one of us is supposed to walk by faith. That tells me that we, you and I have to be declaring things in our lives. If we're walking by faith, we will be declaring certain things in our life. Can I hear a good amen? Yeah. Amen. So that's what we've been looking at over the past few weeks. Declaration is different from whispering. Declaration we see from the scripture is like blowing a trumpet. It gets heaven's attention. When you declare in faith, boom, it's like you're blowing a trumpet and it, it's a piercing sound that the heavens hear. God the Father hears it. God the Son, who is the high priest of our confession, hears it. The Holy Spirit hears it. The angel hears it when it's in line with the word of God. Amen. And even the devil hears it and does not like it. 
Nevertheless, he hears it. Praise God. So the power of declaring is in the power of believing. We see that in Mark eleven twenty three, 23, where Jesus said to us, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Praise God. I believe this statement. I said, I believe this statement. You know, he's saying that if you say to something, you know, to be removed and cast in a sea, and you don't doubt in your heart. So the only thing that we have to do is first say it and make sure that what we say we believe will come to pass. He said, if we don't doubt in our heart, Jesus' assurance is that it will happen. Glory to God. Glory to God. And then he goes on and says, so, uh, and, and therefore, whatever things you desire, when you pray, believe you have seen, you, you receive and you have it. He's linking declaration to prayer. And we see that in the life of Jesus. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, first he prayed. He said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And then he declared, Lazarus, come forth. So it's links. And many times we pray, but we don't declare what we're believing for. And we see that also in the life of Peter. Peter prayed for Tabitha or Dorcas, and then he declared, Tabitha, arise. And we see that in the life of Joshua. Joshua prayed that the stand, that, that, uh, prayed to God, and then he declared that the sun should stand still. So there's pray, prayer and declaration. They go together. Now, last week we saw how God calls the things that be not as though they were. God calls the things that be not as though they were. So he declared to Abraham before he had a multitude of descendants, you are the father of a multitude. He said, I'm changing your name from Abram, which meant exalted father, to Abraham. So every time Abraham was introducing himself, he would say, I'm the father of a multitude. Even though he did not have that, even though you and I, you know, we're not born at the time. We're all now sons of, of, and daughters of Abraham. We're the seed of Abraham. Amen? And, and even though um, he, he wasn't in that time, he believed it. So he's always declaring, I'm the father of a multitude. I'm the father of a multitude. How you and I have to learn to call the things that be not as though they were. Amen. So today... We're going to see how that we have to learn how to open our mouth. God wants us to learn to open our mouths. God doesn't want you silent about his purposes. He doesn't want you silent about his will or about his intentions for your life. He wants you to open your mouth concerning his, his purpose, his will, and his intentions. And we're going to see a few scriptures. It's going to really bless you. I was blessed preparing this. You see, God wants us to believe his will and his purpose, and he wants us to speak his will and his purpose. My, my text is from um, Psalm 81 verse 10 and it says this for it was I the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt it was I the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt then it says open your mouth wide and I will fill it with good things how many of you want to experience good things in your life Praise God. So here's a promise that says, open your mouth wide and I'll fill it with good things. God was speaking to his people. And we're going to come back to this scripture. But what I want you to get a hold of is he's saying that, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Now, opening your mouth refers to a willingness to speak or to declare. I remember when I saw this scripture several years ago, I always saw it as expectation, having a certain expectation. The wider your expectation, the more God would literally fill that expectation. But when you go to the scripture, you realize that opening your mouth is speaking about speaking. It's talking about speaking. It symbolizes speaking or declaring. I'm going to prove it to you through the scripture. Is that okay? It's always good to, to, to look at scripture to back what you're saying. Amen? And, and I'm co convinced it means declaration. So open your mouth refers to a willingness to speak. Look at Proverbs chapter 31, verse 8. It says, open your mouth for the speechless, the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and plead your cause of the, to the, of the poor and the needy. Now, this is interesting. A few weeks ago when I was doing the declaration series, uh, somebody asked me a tough question. He says, well, pastor, you're talking about, uh, you're speaking about declaring. How about those who can't speak? You know, and it was, a, it was a good question. How about those who couldn't speak? And I couldn't really answer. You know, like I had a, you know, I was kind of trying to, to answer the, to the best of my ability. I said, you know what, I'm going to ask God about this. And on my way home, I'm driving, and, and I just felt in my heart, God say, if somebody doesn't have legs, what happens? You are the legs for the person. You help them. If somebody doesn't have, an eye, doesn't have eyes, somebody is blind, you become their eyes. You help them. You lead them where they need to go. So if somebody doesn't have a voice, you speak for them. You declare for them. And as I'm preparing this, I see there's a scripture. 
It says, open your mouth for the speechless. Those who can't talk. You got to speak and for them. You have to declare for them. I was excited when I saw that. Okay, but the point I'm trying to, I'm try, point I'm trying to show you is this. He says, open your mouth. So you have to speak for those who can't speak. All right? Then it says, open your mouth. Judge. Judging is declaring righteously, okay? And then plead, another, you know, implore, plead on their behalf. So it talks about opening your mouth and speaking. Look at Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 27. It says, when I speak with you, I will open your mouth and you shall say. Do you see that? I will open your mouth and you shall say. I'm trying to tie opening your mouth with you declaring or speaking. Then Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 27 says, um, Sorry, Ezekiel 29, 21 says, In that day I will cause the horn of the house of Israel to spring forth, and I will open your mouth to speak. I will open your mouth to speak in, the, in their midst. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. I'm trying to establish the fact that when God says, Open your mouth wide and I will fill it, God is talking about you declaring, you speaking, you saying something. Are you, are you with me so far? Help me out a little bit. Are you with me so far? So God wants us to open our mouths. And notice he says, open your mouth wide. Don't be afraid to declare some things that others will find outrageous. When Joshua stood in that battle, he declared something outrageous. He commanded the sun to stand still. It was an outrageous request. But he made it. Amen? I said he made it. Amen. So I, I believe that God wants us to open our mouth. He doesn't want us to be timid when we are declaring. He wants us to be, that's why it's important to declare the purposes of God. Because the purposes of God are really, when you look at it in the natural, they are outrageous. He says you are more than a conqueror. He says that you are an overcomer. He says you, it said anybody who is born of God overcomes the world. Glory to God. He says even out of the mouth of babes will the enemy be silenced. Are you hearing me this morning? Okay. So he says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Now, I want to make this statement from the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 7. It says, there's a time and a season for everything. There's a time to be silent and there's a time to speak. There's a time to be silent and there's a time to speak. Now, the Bible tells us that there's a time and a season to be silent. There's a time and a season to speak. Most of the time, we speak when we should be silent. And many times, we are silent when we should speak. Amen? But there's a season to be silent, especially when you're in pressure situations. That is not the time to just declare your frustration and begin to complain and begin to murmur, just as the people of Israel in the desert. You remember when they were on the, on the verge of getting into the promised land? The Bible says they sent out the, 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 the 12 spies and 10 of them had a negative report. Okay? It was a negative report. If you are in a place of pressure, be like Jairus. Jairus went to Jesus and, and Jairus said, come and lay hands on my daughter and she'll be healed. And he, he gets word from his friend saying, don't bother the master anymore. Your daughter is dead. And then Jesus looks at Jairus and says, don't be afraid. Keep on believing. And we don't see, we don't hear, or we, it's not written what Jairus says after that. He's silent. He's silent. He's not saying, oh, no, she is dead. Oh, no, why didn't you come earlier? Why did you have to stop for somebody? Why did you have to ask a test? You know, he didn't, he was silent. And there's a season to be silent. But I want to declare to you that there's a season also to speak forth the purpose of God. And sometimes when we are supposed to, to speak, we are silent. And you're going to see that silence... Sometimes when you're supposed to speak, it's not good for you. I'm going to show you some pretty interesting things I, I discovered. Now, what is the general guide? Now, you know, we, make, we read statements like Jesus didn't say anything unless he, you know, he said the words I speak are from the Father. That's a pretty tall order, okay? But you know you and I are supposed to be followers of Jesus. We have to be deliberate in the things we say. We have to be careful. Jesus actually says that every, we'll have to give an account of every idle word. That's what he says. I believe him. I believe him. We have to be careful with what we say. The Bible says be slow to speak. Be quick to hear, but slow to speak. You know, Jesus spoke only what the Father spoke. Amen? 
He spoke only for the Father spoke, and he, he did only what he saw the Father doing. So the general guide I have for us that we, is what, find out whether what you're saying is in line with God's purpose or God's will. Is what you're saying in line? Now, if you're going to try and adopt this, you're going to think before you speak. You're going to think before you speak. But it is critical because there is power in the things you say. There's life and there's death in the power of the tongue. We saw that last week. There is death and life in the power of your tongue. So be, be deliberate about what you're saying. Is it in line with God's word or God's purpose? And if you say something, don't go into condemnation. If you say something wrong, don't go into condemnation. Just say, oh, Lord, I'm sorry I blew it. Forgive me. And then move on. Okay, so I don't want anybody to get into condemnation about this. But you got to be careful what you say. Amen? Now, God wants us to be declaring things. Now, sometimes you think, well, it's a difficult exercise. You know what? If you have the attitude of thanksgiving and praise and you're somebody who prays, that's exactly what you're doing. You are opening your mouth wide. Look at the, the, the songs of praise we declare today. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. It's a declaration with music. So it makes it a little easier for us. On Friday, I had a tough day. And I remember in the evening, we came for a prayer meeting. Nine of us met together, and we were worshiping. And I just decided I'm going to worship God. And as I was worshiping God, what I was doing was I was declaring the goodness of the Lord. I was declaring the power of God. I was declaring the fact that he's great and the fact that he's faithful and all these kind of things. And as I was declaring it, with about halfway through, there was a release in my heart. All I was doing was praising God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When you come to the, his house with thanksgiving, you say, thank you, Lord, that you've been good to me today. That's why you don't want to be dormant or passive when they are worshiping God. No! That's why the Bible says that out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have ordained praise. You have ordained strength. Because there's a certain strength that comes as we declare the goodness of God and the mercy of God. And it's the same with prayer. Prayer is opening your mouth wide. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Praise God. God wants us to open our mouths for thanksgiving and prayer and stuff like that. A few scriptures, Psalm 50 verse 14 says, Offer to God thanksgiving. You offer it to him. Open your mouth and give him thanks. Now, it's not so difficult. When you're having your meal, you can thank God. If you have three meals a day and you choose that you're going to thank God and bless God, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful breakfast in Jesus' name. You have given thanksgiving to him. In the afternoon, when you're having your pizza or you're having your banku or whatever it is, praise God, you say, thank you, Lord, for this meal. I give you honor. I give you praise. It's not that difficult. There's a scripture I always, I always um, uh, declare when I'm, I'm eating, you know, and, and, it's, and, and it's concerning health and sickness. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Exodus, I'll give it to you at the end. But in the book of Exodus, it says, he will bless our bread, he will bless our water, and he will take sickness away from the midst of us. So every time I, I, I'm going to pray, I say, I bow my head, I say, thank you, Heavenly Father, for this food you've set before me. And thank you for taking sickness away from the midst of me. And it's tied in with the scripture. But what I'm saying is that I say that every time I'm going to eat. So every time I'm eating, I'm giving thanks. And every time I'm eating, I'm declaring that he will take sickness away from the midst of me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's not as difficult as it, it may seem. No wonder David could praise God seven times. He found reason to praise God. He found reason to praise God. Hebrews, and then you say, well, that's Old Testament. No, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 says this. Therefore, by him, let us continually, can you say continually? Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That's opening your mouth wide, giving him thanks. Open your mouth so he can fill it. Even when it's a sacrifice. I'm telling you, sometimes you, you don't want to open your mouth to praise God. <laughs> I don't know whether it's, it's just me, but sometimes, man, I, the, the circumstances are against me. I don't feel like opening my mouth. I don't feel like raising my hands. I don't feel like clapping my hands. That's when it's the sacrifice of praise. When Paul and Silas were in the prison, 
And the Bible says midnight. They were praying and singing psalms and hymns to God. Do you think they wanted to do that? They, they felt it was, it, they had a goosey feeling, really nice feeling. They wanted, they had been beaten and their legs and their hands were on the stocks. They were chained. But they chose to do it. Like the psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times. They chose to open their mouths, even though the pressure was there. And here it says, let us continually, the words continually means all the time. Do it as often as possible. Sacrifice or praise that, he, that is the fruit of our lives, giving thanks to him. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 17 says this, pray without season. Pray without stopping. In everything, give thanks. Again, notice the thanks. And it says this, for this is the will of God, of, of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is God's will. He wants us to open our mouths, folks. I said he wants us to open our mouths. In declaration, in thanksgiving, in prayer, in praise, he wants us to open our mouths. There's a time to open your mouth. I want to ask you this question. Are you being silent when you should be speaking? Are you giving thanks when you, are you silent when you should be giving thanks? Are you silent when you should be giving praise and honor to God? Are you silent when you should be worshiping God with all that is within you? Are you silent when you should be praying and asking God and saying, Lord, save me or help me? God says, don't be silent. Don't be silent. We need to declare the purpose and the will of God. Amen. What is the danger of silence? Now, this is going to be interesting. What is the danger of being silent? You see, it's a choice. You can choose to open your mouth. God recommends open your mouth wide, and he says, I will fill it. Now, you can choose to close your mouth. And if you close your mouth, you can't fill it, right? Just like God says, I present to you um, blessing and curses, life and death, prosperity and, uh, and, and poverty or lack or whatever it is. And he says, choose that you have a will. So you can choose to be silent. You can choose death. You can choose whatever you want. It is an act of your will. Okay? But what is the effect of silence? The effect of silence is that your situation usually doesn't change. It doesn't change. I'm going to show you some interesting scriptures here, all right? Now, this may be news for, for, for a lot of us. It was new for me, but I want to show you some interesting scriptures. Let's go back to the book of Psalms 81, verse 8 to 16. And just hang in with me. Let's look at the scriptures together, okay? Let's, let's study the scriptures together. Is that okay? All right. Now, let's look at Psalm 81, verse 8. It says this. God is speaking to his people, and now he's kind of admonishing them, all right? And he's telling them some things that they've kind of missed. And this is what he says. Listen to me, O my people, while I give you stern warning, okay? It says, O Israel, if you would only listen to me. And then he's telling them the things they've fallen short of. You must never have a foreign God. You must not bow down before a false God. This was basically the first and second commandments. So they had fallen short of this. Then he goes on and says, For it was I, the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt. And then he says to them, Open your mouth wide and I will fill it with good things. Then he goes on and says this, But no, my people wouldn't listen. They wouldn't listen. So they were not, in other words, they were not honoring him as their, their, their God, right? They were bowing down to other gods, and they were not declaring certain things. Notice what it says in the next verse. For it says, um, but no, my people would not listen. Israel did not want me around. And then it says this in verse 12. So because of the things that happened before, because the things that happened before that they didn't do. So I let them follow their own stubborn desires, living according to their own ideas. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me walking in my paths or walking in my ways. How quickly I would then subdue their enemies. How soon my hands would, would be upon their foes. Those who hate the Lord will cringe before him. They would be doomed forever. But I would feed you with the finest wheat. I would satisfy you with wild honey from the rock. Do you notice that because the people were not opening their mouths, God's hands were tied. He could not subdue their enemies. Because they were not walking in, in, in his ways, which included opening their mouths so that he could fill it. He could not. He said, if only you had done this, I would satisfy you with the finest wheat. So they stayed in their condition 
because they were not walking in his ways. God often wants us to open our mouths to declare his intention, but we don't. And if when we don't, sometimes the breakthrough is hindered. I'm going to show you a few more scriptures. Isaiah 42, 21 says this, but this is my people robbed. 22, I beg your pardon. This is a people robbed and planted. So it's describing the people. I've quoted this scripture in this series. All of them are snared in holes. They're not in a good place. And they are hidden in prison houses. That's a bad place. They are for prey and no one delivers. For plunder and no one says restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will listen and hear for the time to come? Nobody was saying restore. But God wanted to restore, but nobody was saying restore. So because they didn't believe God's intention to restore, they were silent about it, and it kind of held God's hands back. Are you seeing this? You know, they, they stayed in their affliction just because nobody said, Lord, restore. No one said it. Now let me just even take it further. I'm just trying to build a point here. But let me take it further. What is the most important declaration we can ever make? The declaration for salvation. That declaration we make affects us throughout eternity. When we make a declaration that Jesus is Lord. Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 10 verse 9, if you only If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Now, what happens if you do not declare that Jesus is Lord? You are not saved. If you don't believe it in your heart, and you don't declare it, you are not saved. And it withholds the salvation that God has for you. Is this making sense? You're kind of quiet today. But it's, it's, it's amazing. It actually withholds that from you. Salvation for all eternity. Because it says if you believe in your heart and you confess that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. But if you don't, then you are not saved. My goodness. And it affects you throughout eternity. I'll give you John chapter 3 verse 18 says, He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. So it tells me that if you don't declare something you believe concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, unfortunately you are under condemnation. It says why? Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So what I'm trying to teach today is this. We have to learn how to open our mouths and declare God's will and God's purpose and God's intention so that God will fill it. We have to learn to do that. We have to learn to do that. Okay, Psalm 81 again says, open your mouth wide and I will fill it with good things. It's the same as Job 22, 28 where it says, you will declare a thing and I will establish it. And it will be established for you. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Now, let me, let's look at another effect of the open and silent mouth. Now, I'll give the example of Jesus. Is it good to give the example of Jesus? All right, Jesus was somebody who opened his mouth to declare some amazing things. Typical example is Lazarus. He was dead four days. He goes to the, to the graveyard. He tells him to remove the stone. There's a little bit of a protest. But what happens? He declares, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says, Lazarus, who was dead four days, came in his grave clothes and says, remove great, great grave clothes and says, remove the clothes from me. Right? He declared, and what happened? Lazarus was brought to light. Jesus was in the boat with uh, his disciples, and, and, and he said, let's go to the other side. There was a terrible storm. One version says a storm of hurricane proportions, and the water was, being, uh, was flooding the boat. And the Bible says that the disciples were afraid, and, and Jesus, but Jesus was asleep. So they woke him up. The Bible says Jesus spoke to the wind, and the waves settled down. <laughs> Praise God. He said, peace be still, and it happened. So here he's declaring things that are happening. He's opening his mouth and the things are being established. He's opening his mouth and the things are being established. There are several examples, okay? What happened when Jesus was silent? Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7 says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet 
he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, but he was silent. Right? Now, you are going to find out that Jesus was deliberately silent. Why was he silent? Because he wanted to take our oppression, our affliction, our judgment. He was deliberately silent. This is a scripture about the, the, the it's a prophetic word concerning the suffering Messiah. And it paints a picture of a suffering um, a, a Messiah who is oppressed and afflicted. But notice this, the Bible says that he did not open his mouth. He was silent. Now, he was deliberately silent, though. And I can show that from Matthew chapter 26, verse 53. When Jesus is in Gethsemane and the soldiers come to, to take him and arrest him, Peter is trying to resist. And the Bible tells us that Jesus stopped Peter and said, look, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Then he says this in, in Matthew 26, 53, uh, 54, uh, 53. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that says, say it happened this way. He's saying, I can easily call. As soon as I speak, there will be 12 legions of angels. And do you know how much a legion was? Three to 6,000 soldiers. So Jesus is saying, look, I could easily call and my father would at once, immediately, send 36,000 to 72,000 angels and they would defend me. But he chose not to because he wanted to take our oppression, our affliction, our judgment, our sickness. He chose to be silent. He chose not to open his mouth. And so he was oppressed for our sake. What does that teach us? Many of us are, we remain in oppression. Many of us remain in affliction because we don't open our mouths. We have to declare the purpose of God. And sometimes it's not too complicated. All you have to say is, Lord, help me. You're opening your mouth. He says, declare to me. He said, um, uh, call on me in the day of trouble and I will save you. But you've got to open your mouth. You've got to say, I need your help. You've got to say, you have, you have to declare something that is in line with God's word. If you are silent... Then you can remain in that oppression. Even the Son of God, when he didn't open his mouth, even the Son of God was oppressed and afflicted. But he deliberately didn't open his mouth because he was oppressed so that we don't have to be oppressed. He took the judgment so that we didn't have to take the judgment. Is this making sense to you? Now, sometimes you speak and people look at you funny. Don't stop speaking. I said, don't stop speaking. There was a guy called Bartimaeus. He was a blind beggar at the side of the road that leads to Jericho. And Bartimaeus heard that Jesus was around. So as soon as he heard that Jesus was around, at the top of his lungs, he began to shout, Son of David, have mercy on me. All the other folks beside him who could see, they said, shut up. They wanted to silence him. What would have happened if Bartimaeus shut up? He would have remained in his blindness. But the Bible says, even though they said he should shut up, he decided to cry out even louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. Amen. And the Bible says, then Jesus stood still because he heard him. That declaration was like a trumpet and Jesus stood still and heard him and called him, bring him. And then all those who are saying, oh, shut up, be quiet. They said, oh, be of good cheer. The master wants you. The same people that said shut up said, oh, it's your day. Glory to God. But they were telling him to shut up. And so they bring Bartimaeus and then Jesus said, what do you want? He said, oh, that I may have my sight. And then Jesus said, your faith has healed you. Church, it is critical that you and I declare what we desire. Because when we are silent, we can remain oppressed. Now, how often should you declare? I want to say this continually. Continually. You've got to say it all the time. I'm going to give you a few scriptures. But on my way here, I was just praising God. And then something dropped in my spirit. And I was just driving. I said, hallelujah, because it was revelation for me. Do you know that God commissioned Moses? 
And he said to Moses, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to tell him, let my people go that they will serve me in the wilderness. Right? This is a direct commission from God to Moses to, 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 to go to Pharaoh. So Moses goes the first time and said, this is what the God of the, the Hebrews say. Let my people go. He's declaring the exact word that God gave him. He's speaking the purpose of God. He's speaking the intention of God. Let my people go. And then what did um, Pharaoh say? You got to be kidding me. He said, uh-uh, I'm not letting you go. In fact, he made it worse for the people. They had to build brick without straw. And the people begin to complain to Moses. He goes the second time. This is what the God of the Hebrews says. Let my people go that they will serve me. Pharaoh says, no. So a plague comes second time. Third time, he still goes. Fourth time, fifth time. Go check it out. There were so many times he went to Pharaoh. Let my people go that they will serve me. Continually. The devil doesn't want to let go. The devil doesn't want to let go. And even when all the plagues were, were bombarding Egypt, then the, the devil wanted to negotiate. Okay, you, you go, but don't take your children. I'm telling you, the devil doesn't want to let things happen. So you have to continually declare the purpose and the goodness of God. What happens is we get revved up. We're excited one day, you know, and the first week, second week, and we're not seeing any change. And then back to normal. Right? But continually, even Moses had to go several times. I counted, before I, I rush back here, I counted at least eight times. that he said, this is what the God of the Hebrews said, let my people go, that they will serve me. And each time Pharaoh was adamant, and he was adamant, he was adamant, till the, 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 the firstborn um, Egyptians, the sons, they, they died. That's when he let them go. So the lesson to us is that we must continually declare the goodness of the Lord and the greatness of God. Can I hear a good amen? amen? Now, I'll give you a few scriptures here. Psalm 35 verse 27. Psalm 35 verse 27 talks about, I love this scripture. It says, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. Do you favor God's righteous cause? I said, do you favor God's righteous cause? And it says, and let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. You got to say it continually. You got to keep on saying it. Father, I give you praise, I give you thanks, that you delight in my prosperity. Oh God, prosper me so that you will have a smile on your face. But don't just say it once or twice. Let them say continually. That's why it says, let them continually bring a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. That's why it says, pray without season. Pray continually. Don't give up. Remember Jesus um, uh, taught this parable of persistent prayer. That widow who kept on going to the judge, this unrighteous judge. Show me, uh, give me justice. You know, give me justice. Give me justice. Give me justice. And the Bible says that this unjust judge judge because the woman was was bothered he says this woman is bothering me I'm going to give a judge and then Jesus said if even this unjust judge was willing to give justice because of her persistence how much more your heavenly father and then he asked the question when the son of man comes will he find faith on the earth will he find people who are believing and speaking will he find it because what happens is that we stop we stop. But you got to keep going. You got to keep going. And, and, and we need each other. I said we need each other. Sometimes you're having a bad day. Send a quick text message. I need prayer. <laughs> you know, now you don't have an excuse. A text message. I need prayer. Help me out. And somebody will just shoot some prayers up for you. And then it, it, it encourages you in your inner man. But don't be silent you got to open up. you got to say something. I, I, you hear what I'm saying? you got to say something. Even when you're sick, the Bible says, let those who are sick call for the elders. Open your mouth and say, come and pray for me. We have to call the elders. And the elders will come and lay hands on them. And anoint them with oil. Open your mouth wide. And the Bible says he will fill it. Praise God. 
So I want to encourage you today. God is saying, my children, you got to open your mouths wide. What have you been holding back on in terms of declaration? What have you been holding back on in terms of thanksgiving? You know, we have to be careful because the things that we say actually come to pass. As we saw in the case of the 12 spies, when you look at that story, that story is an amazing story. They go into the land, they survey the land, they see that it's a land that's flowing with milk and honey, but they also see the giants. They come back, and then the Bible says they give a bad report. The 10 of them say, you know what, it's a good land, but the giants are there, and there's no way we can take them on. The lands are fortified. You know, there's no way. That was the report they gave. That was a carnal report. It did not consider the purpose of God. Remember I said that that's a guide for us? That's what, it's what you're saying in line with the purpose of God. And then Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, it's true, there are giants in the land, but they are bread. If God is for us, we can take them on. That was in line with the purpose of God. And then when you read that story, there was a whole, you know, they were, the ten were able to influence the entire thing. And then they started going further and further and further downstream. And they said, you know what, God has actually brought us here to kill us. It now changed from, oh man, we can't take them on to, in fact, God's intention and God's purpose is to kill us. Oh, that we had the garlic from Egypt. It completely went downhill. And it was only Caleb and Joshua who kept on saying, look, we can take them on. But all this time, the silent listener was God. And God said something. He said, I've heard exactly what you people have said. That is what you say that I brought you here to kill. You are going to die in the wilderness. And they did. That generation, except for those who are, is it 18 and below? I can't remember the exact amount. 18 and below, you know, they died in the wilderness because of what they said. Because of their declaration. And it was only Joshua and Caleb and the younger folk that entered the promised land. Again, because of what they said. Because of their declaration. Oh, church, we have to learn to talk right. We have to learn to open our mouths wide to fill it. The truth is that there's power in your tongue. And I think a lot of us sometimes, we don't unleash that power. We don't speak when we should. We don't declare when we should. We don't praise when we should. And God is saying today, I want you to declare my purpose and my will over your life. And do it on a consistent basis. Not just once. Don't be discouraged. But keep doing it. And train yourself to do it. Somebody saw me um, this morning and said, how are you doing? I said, fine. And I said, oh, sorry. I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm training myself. Soon it will be second nature. Okay? But I, I'm meditating on these scriptures. So I want it to come from me. I'm blessed and highly favored. In fact, uh, Marlene was telling me how when uh, I think... On Monday, when Peter went, I hope you don't mind my saying this, but when Peter went to the office, you know, and they said, how are you doing? He said, I'm blessed and highly favored. And the woman looked at him and said, really? What do you say? He said, I'm blessed and highly favored. He said, really? Or something to that effect. And when Marlene gets on the scene, she, they ask her, how are you doing? He said, I'm blessed and highly favored. He said, you too? <laughs> Praise God. But the point I'm making is that we have to learn how to talk right we got to learn how to talk right. Bless our children. Oh, I'm telling you, you see, we don't realize it, but even in the Old Testament, there was great credence to the power of the blessing. The power of the blessing. When Esau realized that his father Jacob had blessed Isaac, oh, sorry, when Jacob, yes, Esau realized that Isaac had blessed Jacob instead of him, the Bible said he cried with a bitter cry. And that was just words that were spoken, but they saw the value of the prophetic blessing. They saw the value. And we have to learn to do what God says we should do. And we should open our mouths wide so that he can fill it. Psalmist says that, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives you of all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who delivers you from destruction. It says, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies and who satisfies your mouth with good things. God is saying to you today, I want to satisfy you with some good things. But you got to open your mouth wide so that he'll fill it. Are you ready to open your mouth? I said, are you ready to open your mouth? 
Okay, why don't you stand up with me? Did you get something today? Amen.